Uh, as I've already said tonight, um, this is an important week within the life of the church. Um, we are embarking on what are regular uh, times of ministry uh, with, men, with many non-believing people coming, in, coming into this space and for us to be able to connect and engage um, with many non-believing uh, neighbours. Uh, and the danger uh, for us uh, as a church family is that we can say, um, if this is the case for us, I'm not directly involved in this area or that area, therefore I do not need to pray for this area or that area, or perhaps our attitude can be this, um, I do not need to pray a lot for these different areas of ministry. Uh, tonight, I want us to see that if this church is our home, uh, if we call uh, Denison Baptist Church uh, the place where we uh, come together and, and worship, if we say that we belong to this church family, then we are directly involved um, in these areas of ministry. And the ministry of DBC is our ministry, whether or not we practically serve in these areas. And our direct involvement in, in these ministries comes as a baseline in the form of prayer, of expectant prayer, of believing prayer, and of uh, such that we have confidence that God is going to work uh, in and through our church family as we minister in various ways. Um, so I want to invite us tonight just to plan when it is that we pray for these ministries. Perhaps the easiest thing that we can do as a church family is to check when talk time is on, men's football, um, ESOL. Uh, we can set a reminder uh, on our phones, um, either before or during these times. Uh, and when that wee alarm goes off, don't just turn off the alarm, but actually take time. It doesn't need to be a long time, but just take time to pray and ask that God would bless the work that's been undertaken at that particular point in the week. Um, I was struck by these words during the week from the 19th century author E.M. Bounds, and I hope and pray that as we look at these words tonight and how it is that these words fit so pertinently into who we are and where we're at as a church, uh, we would be challenged uh, and we would choose to, to in some way reflect what it is that E.M. Bounds says here. So he says, it's what the church needs today is not more machinery or better, not new organisations or more in Neville Moth or more in uh, novel methods, but men whom the Holy Ghost can use, men of prayer, men mighty in prayer. The Holy Ghost does not flow through methods, but through men. He does not come on machinery, but on men. He does not anoint plans, but men, men of prayer. Um, and these words have left me with this unavoidable question. Uh, what does it look like for me as your pastor? To not just be a man of prayer, but to be a man mighty in prayer. For you, what will it look like for you to be someone whose whole life is, is one that is characterized by prayer? Someone who is mighty in prayer. Uh, mighty in prayer in the sense that you recognize that it is God and God alone who can work in you to fulfill his purpose for you. Um, if Jesus himself says in John 15, but apart from him we can do nothing, then we can be certain, we can be absolutely certain that apart from prayer to our God, we can do nothing, absolutely nothing. And it's always a danger for us to just get busy doing ministry and to forget the role of prayer eh, as we minister and serve. Because what we see is, is obvious to us and the most natural thing is to then see that and respond in some practical way without first praying. It's always a challenge. Uh, this week I was sharing the story uh, of this church since we began the replant uh, and it was only as I was sharing it um, that I was struck by how much my heart had explained away different things that God had done and it wasn't necessarily the case that when God stepped in in great power in, in various moments in this six or seven year journey that I, I didn't recognize that as God and the moment I probably did I saw it as God working in great power. Um, but looking back, I can so often think about this moment or that moment and explain it away and say, that was going to happen anyway. And that's always a danger for us. When we pray and, and we ask God to help and then he helps, then we can so often say in our mind and in our heart, it was going to happen anyway. Um, sharing it afresh made me realise um, that it is God who turns the engine on when it comes to ministry. 
it is God who puts, it, puts his foot on the accelerator and it is God who turns the steering wheel and it is God who is still doing all of these things every single day uh, and as we move into the future, it will always be God who does this. He's the one who turns the engine on. He will um, put his foot on the accelerator and he will turn the steering wheel. And our job in all of that is to sit in the passenger seat and let him take control. Um, when you pray, when I pray, when, when we pray as a family, uh, what we are doing is consciously choosing to sit in the passenger seat. We're not trying to take control of ministry or of church. We're saying, God, you, you drive this thing. You direct us. We surrender to you in this moment. We come before God with a recognition that he knows what is very best for us and for our community, that others might come to know what we know and what we have. And this was characteristic of Paul's entire life and ministry post road to Damascus. And when you look at the writings of Paul, everything he wrote in the New Testament, you'll find over 50 occasions when he speaks about prayer and the role of prayer, the power of prayer, the necessity of prayer. And the encouragement to those he's writing to is always, always, always one of prayer. And one of those occasions is in our passage uh, tonight, and what it is we read in Romans 15, 30 to 33. So as we ask the question, how it is that we should pray uh, for ministry, our only go-to place is scripture. And we can be certain that how it is that Paul prayed for ministry is how we ought to pray for ministry. Uh, so let's learn from the example of Paul by praying like him when it comes to ministry and the role and the purpose that God has for each one of us. As we look at his example, let's see it as a healthy example uh, and let us in some way imitate him as he sought to imitate Christ. These words, from, these words of Paul in praying for ministry apply to all of us, every single one of us, because none of us are exempt from this call to pray for the work of ministry within the life of the Denison Baptist Church. So our question tonight is this, how does Paul pray for the ministry that he's, di he's directly involved in? And how in turn does this then have an impact on how we pray for ministry? So how does Paul pray for ministry? And how does this have an impact on how we then pray for ministry? These are the two questions we're asking. In ministry lesson one, uh, Paul prayed in community. Paul prayed in community, verse 30. Paul says this, Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, through our Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in fervent prayers to God on my behalf. I don't know about you, do you not just love how Paul writes his letters? This is a man who loved the Lord and he loved the fact that he had this opportunity to serve the Lord through ministry. So Paul uses this word appeal. He's writing to these believers and he's pleading with them. He's pleading with them to take heed of what it is he has to say. I appeal to you. I'm begging you. Would you hear what it is I have to say here? And Paul underlines the need to strive. And he's wanting them to take hold of this, this prayer call upon their life. Paul says strive because he recognises that prayer is a struggle. Put your hand up. You think prayer is a struggle? Prayer is a struggle. It is a daily, daily battle to pray. And so we strive. We, in some sense, as we think about Jacob in the Old Testament, we wrestle with God in our prayer times. Uh, and we're asking God to, to step into this situation or that situation. Or we're asking God just to give us a, a greater love for him in our lives. And it feels like a struggle. Our minds can wander. Our hearts can, can be drawn to something else. And we find ourselves coming back to God and then wandering again, going somewhere else and then coming back to God. It's a struggle. So this is why Paul says strive. We need to strive. So I appeal to you, strive, strive. And finally, Paul uses the word fervent. And that's a, I just love that word, fervent. It sounds better when you say it in a Scottish accent as well. It's a brilliant word. For Paul, he wants his believers in Rome to pray with passionate intensity. Uh, to not just be a people who pray, but to be a people who love prayer because more than anything else, they love God. Um, if you love God, you will love prayer. Prayer is a gift that God has given to us to meet with him. So we talk to God when we pray 
and God ministers to us through his spirit. So if we love God, we will pray. What a challenge. I'm so challenged by that in my own life. And for Paul, his point to these believers in Rome is this. I'm just paraphrasing this entire verse. I'm begging you, brothers and sisters, be passionate prayer warriors for me, even when it is difficult for you to do so. Because in your praying for me and with me with passion and focus, you are fulfilling God's purpose for your life. So here we have Paul, this apostle, this, this great man of God, the one who God chose to bring the good news to the Gentiles. And here he is being honest and open and vulnerable. He's opening up his heart. He's revealing to these believers in Rome that he is as much in need of grace as anyone else who knows and loves the Lord Jesus. And this is the basis of his prayer. I so need God, brothers and sisters in Rome. Therefore, I'm pleading with you, pray fervently for me. So you can't help but see that the Apostle Paul here was a man just like us. Yes, he was this intellectual giant, and he was a, a great man of prayer, mighty in prayer, but he was a broken sinner. And he needed God's grace, just like any one of us needs God's grace. And here we discover one of the key signs of Christian maturity. There's a personal recognition of weakness. Uh, and not just that, but there's a desire to express that weakness. Um, and a desire to express needs amongst other believers out of a longing that they in turn might pray for you. This is Paul's whole focus in these verses. So we can so often think Paul and think he never needed prayer. But here we have him open, honest, vulnerable, earnestly asking these believers to strive in fervent prayer. And we can so often fall for the lie, and this is a lie from the world, and that the person who never shares struggles or difficulties is the person who is secure, the person who is confident, the person who has it all together. And it's quite the opposite. The person who never shares their struggles and needs is the person who more often than not thinks they have it all together and they are in fact deluded. The reality is, if they don't seek prayer from others, they will not seek God in prayer. It's that simple. So, Paul's needs and requests here highlight for us this morning that any venture or work of ministry has to result in us praying together in community. It has to be the beating heart of who we are. Um, and this has to involve openness and honesty within the church about the needs and struggles that exist within any particular ministry within the life of the church. And note from Paul's words here, uh, this isn't optional for us. Uh, this is an overflow of our new identity in Christ. Um, notice, Paul says here, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, through our Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, in the first verse. In other words, the reason why you should pray for me, church in Rome, is because you are Christian. This is Paul's whole premise for praying for him. Some commentators would even go as far as to say that Paul is in fact being a lot more forthright than that. But he is in fact saying, if you really are who you say you are, then you will pray for me and for, for my ministry. In other words, being a follower of Jesus and being a person of prayer is synonymous, or it should be synonymous. You can't separate the two. Who you are is what you do. If you really love Jesus, then you really will pray. Challenge, what a challenge for me. Paul actually says something similar in Philippians 2, in verses 1 to 2, and it'll be up on the screen for us. Paul says, If then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in Spirit, intent on one purpose. In other words, let your actions, let your actions match up with your identity. For it is only when we live as we have been called that life will make sense, that we will have a peace and a purpose because we're rooted in Christ. And it's so easy in this individualistic culture uh, to think that your prayer life is solely something that you do by yourself. And, and that is important. Uh, tonight I want us to recognize that it is important we have times away, alone, separate from the world, with God, seeking his face. 
That is a necessity every single day. We see this in the life of Jesus and we see this in other examples throughout the New Testament. Um, but when you see how it is the early church did church, when you read the epistles, uh, you see how it is that Paul and others encouraged the believers, you see also the absolute necessity of corporate prayer. So yes, we pray alone with God in his word. And yes, at the same time, we recognise the need uh, to pray together as a church family. And uh, understand my heart tonight, and I said this this morning, I say this in love, um, but what does that tell us about us as a church family? There's 10 recorded instances of corporate prayer solely in the book of Acts. And yet the majority of us as a church family would struggle uh, to pray during the week within the life of Dennis and Baptist. If we really do long to see God move in great power, as we saw God move in great power in the book of Acts, then as they did, we need to also pray together as a church family. They met on a regular basis to pray. They saw God transform their own lives and transform the lives of other people. And so let us, church family, do the same. Let us walk in that light. Um, I think we would all agree that all scripture, including the book of Acts, is God-breathed, useful for, for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that Denison Baptist Church might be thoroughly equipped for every good, good work. I think we would agree with that tonight. Therefore, let us walk in their example. Let us walk in their ways. Known that as we pray, we will see God continue to work in power. Um, when you think of our ministries tonight, talk time, men's football, Esau, are you aware of the fact that none of these will bear fruit? In fact, potentially some of these ministries might die a slow death unless we seek the Lord together, unless we ask for his divine intervention. And the beauty for doing ministry in that way is that none of us can take any credit. If we, if we are masters at planning and doing things with excellence, and planning and excellence are important, but if that's all we do when it comes to ministry, and we don't pray, and we don't seek the Lord and ask for his divine intervention, then there's always that danger that we take the credit, we get all the glory for the ways in which our ministries have been successful. God calls us to seek his face so that at the end of fruitful ministry, all we can say is it's all, all about Jesus and it's all for Jesus. He's the one that gets all the glory. We just take a step back as people see us and see Christ in us. So that's the first ministry lesson. The second one is this. Paul prayed with hopeful expectation. Hopeful expectation, verse 31. Uh, let's take a moment at what Paul writes in this verse. And he has two important points of prayer. And with his prayer requests, we see the hope that Paul has with regards to these particular circumstances in his life. So Paul says this, Pray that I may be rescued from the unbelievers in Judea, that my ministry to Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. Two prayer requests. So what's exactly, what's happening with Paul here? It's important we understand what's actually going on at this particular moment in Paul's life to understand why it is he asks the church in Rome to pray for this. And if you remember, we spent time looking together at Romans 15 and verses 1 to 13. Way back, way back at the beginning of July, it was the first Sunday of this sermon series. Um, and we were thinking about being a people who pray with hope. And in the section between that passage, we looked at back in the first Sunday in July. And our passage today, so verses 14 through to 29, what we discover is that Paul is on his way to Jerusalem. And from there, from this city, he's going to go to Rome, to the brothers and sisters he's writing to here in this passage. And then from there, Paul's plan is to go to Spain, to preach the gospel, to plant a church or churches, to encourage the believers in that particular context. And on his way to the first point of this missionary journey, he has a gift for these Jewish believers, a, finan a financial gift from the Gentile church to the culturally Jewish church in Jerusalem. A church that was a lot poorer than the Gentile church. So what's happening with Paul? Well, I believe Paul feels this weight of responsibility. This gift was way more than a financial gift. 
This is Paul acting as a conduit between Gentile and Jewish believers. And he recognizes that this role he has could be disrupted either externally or internally. Externally, Paul was seen as a threat. This is why he says, pray that I may be rescued from the believers in Judea. In the city of Jerusalem, Paul was regarded as a religious and cultural revolutionary. And the Jewish people of his day despised him. They absolutely hated him. So you, you only have to read the many examples of Jewish opposition towards Paul. Uh, we see it in Acts 9.29. Acts 13, 44 to 45 in verse 50. Acts 17, 5 to 8 in verse 13. Acts 18, 12 to 17. Acts 19, 8 to 9 or Acts 23 to see that this man Paul was in many regards, in many regards he was regarded as public enemy number one in Jerusalem and in this region of Judea. <clears throat> the one who persecuted Jesus now preached Jesus. His life had been completely transformed and the Jewish community were concerned that everything of who they were and what they did would begin to unravel the more and more Paul had prominence and influence within this particular city. So Paul here prays with this hopeful expectation that he might be rescued from these unbelievers in Jerusalem. And the Greek word for unbeliever, it's actually stronger than this notion of unbelief that we have. When we say that someone doesn't believe, Sometimes that can be seen in a kind of passive sense that they don't have a personal responsibility for consciously choosing not to believe in Christ. Um, but the Greek word that Paul uses here could easily be translated rebel or disobedient. These rebels in Jerusalem, the disobedient in Jerusalem, all of which reminds, reminds us of the fact that to not have faith in Christ is not a subconscious thing. It's a conscious rejection of God. We so often forget that. We think, oh, that's just something that someone's decided through circumstance or just through, through whatever it might be. They've chosen or they haven't in some way chosen not to believe in God. But here Paul says, everyone who is not in Christ has consciously chosen to reject Christ. Everyone has responsibility of either receiving or rejecting him. And Paul continues with his hopeful expectation. So he makes this request for prayer that my ministry to Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. So he's went from external to internal. And the key word is acceptable. The question I want to ask tonight is this, in what way did Paul want his ministry to be acceptable? Well, I don't think it's him wanting to be popular. Two things come to mind. Acceptable in the sense that these Jewish believers would actually receive a gift from Gentile believers. Because it would have taken a lot of humility for a group to receive a gift from another group they had spent so much of their lives looking down on. And that's, that's the amazing power of the gospel. It just reverses cultural expectations. So everyone in the city would expect these Jewish believers to reject this gift. And yet they say, they had this responsibility, this call to say, no, we're going to receive this. We're going to honour these Gentile believers by receiving this gift. The gospel just turns things completely upside down and brings significant challenge. And it's precisely why Paul experienced so much opposition and threat. And acceptable in the sense that the non-believing Jews had not influenced the believing Jews in the church in Jerusalem. So that when Paul arrived with his ministry, he would have been neglected or even worse, he would have been rejected by these brothers and sisters in Christ. There was every chance that what was happening in the city and the opposition of the city towards Paul would then trickle into the church and Paul would experience this opposition as well. So Paul's looking at these two potential pitfalls. He sees what might happen, both externally and also internally. And he is undeniably hopeful. He realizes it's only God who can step in and transform the hearts and minds of the city and the church. So he's asking the church in Rome to pray that what might happen would not happen and that the favour of the Lord would be upon his ministry as he sought to love both unbeliever and believer. And so it is when it comes to our ministries within the life of the church. Esau, football, thought time. <clears throat> I hope you're aware of the fact there's always potential for things to go wrong. 
disunity within the team, opposition from unbelievers, lack of response from the community, just a general discouragement, feeling tired and weary, battle weary. Every single ministry has a potential to turn that way and to take a direction that none of us ever longed or dreamed for. That's the reality. And yet, the reality is, this reality is also true. There's nothing that we can do to then manipulate ministries so that they might do or become what it is we hope for. No amount of planning or coercion or striving within ourselves will ever prevent these things from happening and produce the fruit that we long to see. So we need to hold on to these two realities. Things might go wrong and there's nothing that we can do within ourselves to change that potential. So our hope comes in the fact that we have a God who can protect us and we have a God who can produce abundant fruit within talk time, within football and within his whole ministry. And like any ministry, the danger is we just do stuff. We just get busy doing stuff and we forget the why. We focus on the, fo- on the what and we so often can forget the why. Prayer is at the heart of the why. As we understand why we do it, we seek the Lord and ask that he would produce fruit within these ministries. It is God and God alone who can transform unbeliever as we seek to love and display Jesus to them through our words and actions in all these different areas. And if it is God alone who can do that, then this is what our hope is in. Or rather, this is who our hope is in. The way in which we nurture and cultivate this hope is through what? It's through prayer. There is no other way. The more we pray, the more hope we have. Because we're opening ourselves to the presence of God and we're asking that he would minister through us as we love and engage with non-believer in these ministries and in other ministries. So take a moment to reflect on these three ministries and ask yourself this question. What would you love to see God do from now until mid-December when we fin- when we finish up again for Christmas? Um, when we identify our hopes in these areas, we then have the basis of what it is we should pray for. Not in a God you will do this. Thomas spoke about this last week. We're not demanding that God would do this and that in this particular ministry. But instead, we come boldly to the throne of grace and we say, God, please, would you step in? God, we would love to see this happen. Would you step in and would you transform this person's life or that person's life? God, would you give us unity within the team? God, would you equip us to be all that you have called us to be? Would you provide people for these ministries so that we can be a tangible and a verbal blessing to them through the hope that we have? So we can do all of that. We can think about what we long to see in these ministries and then pray into that in the power of the Spirit. And amazingly, God so often goes way beyond anything that we could ever dare to ask or imagine. So as we hope and pray that God might do this, he just broadens our expectation and does something even greater or better. So what a challenge and what an encouragement for us as a church family. And then the third lesson is this. Paul prayed with a kingdom vision, uh, verse 32 to 33. Let's take a moment to read what it is that Paul writes in these last two verses. And he makes these two requests, protection from unbelievers and acceptance from believers And he then says this in verse 32. And that by God's will, I may come to you with joy and be refreshed together with you. May the God of peace be with all of you. Amen. So Paul in his ministry, he's already thinking one step ahead. And he hopes and prays and asks the church in Rome to pray into what it is that God might do in his ministry in Jerusalem. So he's talking to the church in Rome and he's saying, Pray that God would do this as I go there. And he then starts to look beyond that and he starts to think about what it is God might do in Rome as a result of answered prayer in Jerusalem. So he says, pray that God would do this and that we would have answers to prayer so that I might then be a blessing to you guys when I meet you in Rome. That really gives you some kind of idea of, of Paul's whole focus. Paul had a kingdom focus, a kingdom focus for the here and now, but also a kingdom focus beyond that into the next stage of ministry. 
he's carrying a kingdom vision of what it is that God might do, both in Jerusalem and in Rome. Again, what a challenge for us. What an example Paul is to each one of us. He's not praying the kind of prayer that we at times can pray, and the prayer that's so broad in general, the kind of miss world prayer doesn't really mean anything. God, we pray that you bless the entire world. We pray that you bless everyone. Nor is he praying about trivialities. He's not saying, God, we pray that you help Apollos with his mild toothache. And sorry, you guys had to hear that joke a second time. <laughs> um, he's praying with a real and authentic kingdom vision. Uh, Paul realizes he can't pray for everything, but what he can pray for is that which really matters. That which God longs for in his, in his life. Paul was all about the gospel, going into unreached places, and churches being planted, and churches being strengthened. This was Paul's heart, because, because of what? Because of why? Because this was Jesus' heart. Jesus had this vision, so Paul had this vision. And you only have to look at Jesus' prayer in John 17 to see that what the Apostle Paul is doing in our passage and elsewhere He's continuing the message of Jesus, the prayer of Jesus, the heart of Jesus for this world and for his bride, the church. And so it is for us at Denison Baptist. Um, do you and I want to pray for the ministry of this church in a way that is kingdom-centered, Christ-inspired? Then we ought to pray as the Apostle Paul prays. We must pray that the church would be strengthened that churches would be planted or replanted, that the gospel would reach the unreached in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we must also pray, thinking one or two steps ahead of what it is that God might do within our own ministries. Uh, when you think of these ministries we have, uh, we can be thinking about the potential for Bible studies to spring up out of talk time, out of football, out of Esau, we can be praying that God would bring salvation to these, from these Bible studies. We can be praying that the people who come to faith in Christ would also bring their family to faith in Christ through their faithful and fruitful witness. We can be praying for transformation in all of these ways. And what are we doing? We're thinking two or three steps ahead, just as Paul was thinking two or three steps ahead. This is how the apostle prayed. He prayed with kingdom vision. Isn't this how we should also pray as a church family? Is there any other life more exciting than that? When we're on the cutting edge of mission, we're praying that for the glory of God and for the good of the city, we would see transformation. Is there anything better than that? To live that kind of life in Jesus' name. Um, tonight, as we've done this morning, I think it's just helpful for us to, to pray again. Uh, for these areas of ministry and we'll just pray as one group so feel free uh, just a few of us uh, there's no expectation that any of you need to pray but if you do feel led to pray you can do that um, let's just take a moment to, to focus um, on three areas uh, that we can pray into when it comes to these ministries starting back up again so for talk time uh, pray that we may say we may see pa many parents bring along their children and we will have opportunity to build relationships and share the gospel. Uh, for men's community football, pray that we have a core group of players with a good balance of believers and unbelievers. Pray for opportunity to meet together um, outside of the game for a coffee. Pray that many would come to faith. Uh, for Esau, uh, pray as we consider doing an additional Esau group, spending time learning English through the study of God's word. Pray for a good response. And again, many coming to know Jesus as Lord. So... Uh, let's just take a moment uh, to pray into these areas uh, and then I'll close. Let's do that now.
single person that um, we are in such a family connect with and through these ministries or, or connections loosely through these ministries Father I just pray um, that every single person that is at them that they have a real um, sense and knowledge of you and they have a burden to, to know you more to seek you more and that um, those from the church and those who put up in you as a Lord Lord and Saviour that they um, yeah, that you can just radiate through their lives in every mm-hmm. every aspect in the way that they make um, the tea and coffee in the way that they um, speak and their patience and their kindness um, in the way that they react to things like football and all these different aspects Father I just pray um, yeah, for, for every single person involved in these ministries and every person that they'll be um, touched through them I ask these things in your name
Now, Lord, we, we do pray for every unbeliever who's going to uh, walk into this, this building um, or walk onto that pitch uh, from now till uh, Christmas. And, and Lord, we, we just confess it that we can't save anyone. It is only you uh, that can save. Uh, we thank you that salvation belongs to you and we want to be open and receptive to how you might work through us. And we pray, Lord, that, that you would guide us to, to the right person or the right people. Help us, Lord, to, to love uh, as you have loved us. And help us to speak the right words in the right moment. And Lord, I pray that we would, we would carry your, your power and that we would be reliant upon you. And that you would speak uh, and work through us in ways that, that can only be of you. So, Lord, we, we commit uh, this, this term, this season to you and pray that you would bless it in incredible ways. And again, Lord, we, we do lift up uh, talk time tomorrow as it starts for the first time. We, we do pray for, for Dina and Rebecca and for the team um, that it would go well. We, we pray that you would just uh, protect that ministry from any potential opposition. We know the enemy often tries to attack um, when something is at a formative stage, an embryonic stage, and we just pray against any work of the evil one. We pray, Lord, that that would be a fruitful ministry that would continue for, for many years to come. And, and Lord, we, we thank you that we have this privilege to represent you, to be your ambassador within this community. And we, we ask that you work in and through us so that you may get all the glory and so that this city may be changed. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys.